<laughs> Hello, Internet. I am Jeff, and this is Ask Jeff Anything, Volume 11. I am the founder and Dumas CEO of Worldwide Cyclery, and I'm going to answer all of your questions from Instagram and YouTube, and I promise you there will be some really good mountain bike knowledge, humor, interesting things about me and our business and various other things, but either way, it will be entertaining. I'm working on my stand-up comedy, so check this out. What is a good do-it-all MTB, travel, geo, etc.? I think the perfect MTB for every possible scenario is a 130 mil travel 29er with a 150 mil travel fork with the Geo that's similar to like a Yeti SB130 or a Revel Rascal. Uh, I really like those bikes. Those are just like good do-it-all bikes. A lot of people make a good 29, 130 mil travel bike that you can put a 140 or 150 mil travel fork on. And that's just a good bike that conquers a ton of terrain and still works really well climbing and going fast uphill. So hopefully that helps. Hello, Jeffrey. We've been trying to reach you about your car's extended warranty. Can I please have your social security number and bank login to fix your reoccurring payments? I hate those phone calls! What gives you motivation and drive every morning? I don't know exactly, or maybe I do, I don't know. I just want to live my life, have a really good time, enrich people's lives, do a good job at running a great business, and just be the weird self that I am and have a good time on the planet while I'm alive. So I don't know, mostly fun. I think that's how I'd wrap it up, having fun, but also still like not losing sight of the fact that I do want to create and actually do things that are meaningful to me and hopefully to other people. What's the worst and or most dangerous component failure you've had while riding? When I was younger, I used to ride BMX a ton and I had a diamond back frame, uh, the head tube, cracked and I knew there was a crack in it and I just decided to keep riding it because I thought who cares maybe it'll break and that'll be cool because that's the kind of shit that you think when you're a 12 year old kid and then I remember hitting a jump on it and landing and the entire front end of the bike just vanished beneath me and I smashed my face into the ground and really regretted riding a broken frame so don't do that kids and don't ride a diamond back If you had to only ride a unicycle or tricycle, which one would you pick? Tricycle, because when I worked at a local bike shop as a kid, we used to build these tricycles and you could ride them on two wheels and it was really fun, or you could pedal really fast and get in the basket and stand up and go like this, like you were on the Titanic. I'm the king of the world! I'm the king of the world! It was a lot of fun. Tricycles are great. You can put all your luggage, your friends, whatever. Tricycle for sure. What do you guys think is the price point at which mountain bikes start to have significantly diminishing returns? I've always thought maybe somewhere between three and 4K. I totally agree. I actually always talk to people about that because a lot of my friends, especially in the last 16 months or so, when a lot more new people got into mountain biking, contacted me and they're like, hey man, I'm getting into mountain biking. How much money should I spend? I always tell people about four to five K because once you get four to five K, <laughs> really funny. Really funny. You get really nice things like a dropper post, a carbon frame, um, hydraulic disc brakes, good tires, relatively good components all around, and I think that gets you a really good bike. And then beyond five K, it's small stuff. It's stuff that bike snobs, bike nerds will really love and appreciate. Wow. But it's stuff that like more of a novice probably won't notice, but I think any novice would notice the difference between a 2K bike and a 5K bike. So I think somewhere around four to 5K is really like a great bike. Beyond that, it is kind of diminishing returns. If you could eat any meal for the rest of your life, what would it be? Uh, ideally, it would just be a pill. I would like to have perfect nutrition for my daily activities and my nutritional goals wrapped up in a pill. I would take one single pill every morning and I wouldn't have to eat. It would be extremely efficient. And just really convenient. I like efficiency, so that's what I would do. There's my answer. When the fudge is the Kettle Canyon bid coming back into stock? Everyone is pissed, brah. Uh, I actually wrote that comment myself from the Kettle Mountain Instagram. Long story. Kettle Mountain's brand we own. I think I've said this on YouTube a hundred times, and Raymond, who edits these videos, always makes fun of me because I keep saying that. Uh, anyways, uh, the bib is really nice. A lot of people really like that thing, and we did not manufacture nearly enough of them, and they've been sold out for like over a month now. Give me all you got! Give me all you got! 
We have a bunch more coming in November of this year. It's a really good bib. But we also have a ton of other good stuff that we worked really hard on engineering and designing for just really various reasons that we care about. Anyways, check out the Kettle Mountain site, ketlmtn.com. Myself and the Worldwide Cyclery crew are working really hard to make a killer mountain bike apparel brand that also has a very outdoor and leisurely aesthetic that works good for just adventure travel wear. So please check it out. What if in an alternate universe that didn't have bikes, but had everything else, what would you choose to have fun? And what would it be and why the Chrysler Voyager? Let me tell you about my Chrysler Voyager. Hi, my name is Jeff Cayley and this is why I love my Chrysler Voyager. The power delivery is smooth. You can parkour this baby like no other minivan. The electronic parking brake, for some reason, works while moving. The doors have the force. The stow and go seating allows me to fit every one of my friends in here and all of our shit. On top of all of that, I just feel like a pure gangsta driving this sucker. It's a minivan life for me. No oval anymore? Why? Uh, that is regarding chain rings. Obviously, we made a video all about oval chain rings where I mentioned I really do enjoy ovals, and I do, and I would pretty much always run one on my mountain bike because I think they do actually work better, and I enjoy it. So if you haven't seen that video, check it out. We really went in detail into oval chain rings and had a lot of other various sort of like general mountain bikers test them and give their feedback and thoughts about it. Um, I do like ovals for mostly, I think, the power delivery, a lot of technical climbing on mountain bikes. More power, baby! Yes! Uh, where you have minimal traction and you're doing just rocky, rooty climbing. I think ovals really help in those scenarios, which is why I like them. I don't currently have one on either of my bikes because uh, they don't fit. Uh, there's like a all these weird offsets. Carbon bikes have such tight tolerances with how close the chainring is. And then you have to get like a chainring that fits the cranks, direct them out and then has a perfect offset and then not hit the frame. My brain hurts! Uh, almost all the time you can figure out one that'll fit an absolute black who's kind of like the leader in the oval chainring world and makes a ton of various ones that do fit, but on the current bikes with the current cranks I have, I can't get one to fit, at least for my Rebel Ranger. I could on my Rascal, which I'm probably gonna do that. I should email Liam and tell him to put that on my bike. Can you get the creak out of my carbon frame? I can't tell where it's coming from. Laughing emoji. Uh, a lot of people ask that question. It is a huge issue with full suspension mountain bikes in general, whether they're carbon or they're aluminum. My process with that is kind of a process of elimination. So one, the longer you've been in the bike industry, the more you know where that creek could potentially be coming from, like the, the problematic areas that are the most common, bottom brackets, main pivots, headsets, um, things like that. Those are the things you want to address and test first. Beyond that, um, you have a lot of pivots on your bike, one by one, figure out how you, one, how you can recreate the creek, whether that's like a certain pedal stroke or leaning the bike a certain way in the parking lot while you're riding it. Like figure out how you can consistently recreate the creek and then one by one, like loosen one bolt and then go out and try and recreate the creek. And if it sounds exactly the same, it wasn't that bolt. And then do it to the next bolt and then the next one. And then obviously you hit the most common problematic creaky things first, like what I mentioned earlier. I don't get it. So that's like the process of elimination to get rid of these creeks. A lot of people ask that, and <laughs> we've received a lot of money in service labor to just fix people's creaky bikes, uh, when really they probably could have figured it out in 30 minutes by themselves if they just had the patience and diligence to one by one go through the various things, figure out how to recreate the creek, and then one by one go through them, see how it gets rid of the creek. So good question, a lot of people ask that. Will Jeff start an OnlyFans? I don't know. What are you willing to pay or see on OnlyFans from me? Comment down below. <laughs> Where do you see bike geometry in five years? Uh, I don't see it that much different, to be honest. I think, I think we've hit a little bit of a limit on what bike geometry can be without it being too much. And what I mean by that is you can only go so long, low, and slack on a bike to where it only works for a certain type of rider on certain types of trails, but then again, it doesn't work for most riders on most trails. What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? I think we've hit that point, and I think people have geometry preferences where they want a bike that handles a little bit more like a downhill bike or a little bit more like an XC bike, depending on their preference and where they're riding it. 
but I don't really see bikes changing a ton beyond this. I think, again, certain brands will favor more downhill geo because their audience and the people who buy that brand are those kind of riders that want to go fast and slash corners and ride steep stuff and don't mind the disadvantages to it climbing. And I think some brands will bull it down the middle. And some brands will kind of lean more towards the conservative side that kind of works for most riders and especially those riders who don't really care that much about it. So I think we've kind of hit the end. This is the end, beautiful friend. Of this like, consistently going longer, lower, slacker thing. Um, yeah, that's my thoughts. Is it better to be overbiked or underbiked? Um, mm, it's a tough question. I really enjoy being underbiked. I think it's really fun. I recently was out visiting our store in Reno, Nevada, and I did a mountain bike ride with that whole crew, and I rode a gravel bike because it was all I had at the time with me there, and it was has flat bars and a dropper post still, but it's rigid and had 42C tires, and uh, it was like horrendous on the trail that we rode, and I was essentially dying on the thing and was extremely underbiked. And a couple of the staff had Yeti SB150s, which 150 mil travel 29er. They were very much overbiked. I was underbiked. I thought it was fun. It's a challenge. It's dangerous, um, but it makes it much more challenging to like ride the same pace. And I don't know. I think that's fun. But in other cases, you might want to be overbiked because I don't know. You're it's just safer. If the trail gets really gnarly. Oh, gnarly! Um, it's probably better to have more suspension to deal with that rather than just go over the handlebars, which I would have done if we were riding somewhere gnarlier. <laughs> what do you think about Intense selling bikes through Costco? So, if you didn't hear that news story... Uh, I'll go ahead and make sure you get another copy of that memo. Okay? Yeah, no, I, 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 I have the memo. I've got it. It's right. The Intense Cycles, which is an iconic American-made, well, was American-made, uh, mountain bike brand that's been around for longer than I've been alive, I think. Uh, they recently announced that they were going to sell bikes through Costco. I think it was Costco online only, and it was only like a certain model or build kit. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't see an issue with it. A lot of people shop at Costco, and there's a lot more new people getting into the sport of mountain biking, um, largely because of the pandemic drove a lot of people to really gain interest in the sport, which is a great thing, and Intense makes good, good bikes, and I don't know. I don't really see a problem with it. I guess you could look at it two ways. You could look at it and be like, well, is this now degrading intense as a brand because they're like being sold at Costco rather than selling direct or selling through high-end, you know, specialty mountain bike retailers specifically. Yeah, I think to some people it will degrade their brand because of that. Like you don't want to ride a bike as a high-end mountain biker that costs you 10 grand that someone could see and be like, oh, I saw that at Costco. Like, ah! That's not fun, so I think it does probably degrade Intense's brand a little bit. But on the Intense side, it might make a lot of business sense because maybe they can move more units through Costco, they can move them to people who are getting into the sport who then will buy one of their nicer models further down the line. You know, there's a lot of business stuff that's wrapped up, you know, behind the scenes with decisions like that. So I don't fault Intense for doing that. I think there'll be some pros and cons to it, undoubtedly, I'm sure they're aware of that but I would assume they did that because they think it's the best thing for their business to continue to survive and hopefully thrive in the future. And that's it. That's all. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for watching. I appreciate it. I will try to do these videos once every six to eight weeks or so. Um, look for the YouTube community or the Instagram post where we ask for more of your questions. And uh, see you guys next time. Cheerio.